Hello, I'm Greg Maskry. Thank you for joining us. What does liberty mean? Our country has always had laws in place to protect us from others, as well, as well as laws to protect us from ourselves. In a country founded on the ideal of liberty, should my expectations of government include asking them to save me from myself? Each of us has the right to live our life the way we see fit, not the way someone else does, as long as those choices don't deny someone else of an equal right. So, uh, liberty has to be, uh, in some respects, um, um, temperamented so that uh, you're not infringing upon other people's liberties. In order to have a society that functions well, we all have to agree to curb some of what we would think is a freedom because of the common good. So, but I think government has an obligation to protect society as a whole, and that's why we have these laws. I think as long as you're not intentionally causing unnecessary harm, and as long as you realize that we live in a society where there are laws, many of them have been thought through, some are good, some are bad, that have the intention of protecting all of us, then we should be completely free. So the side effects of victimless crime laws are almost always worse than the social problems that were created by the activity itself. With us today are some experts in various fields who will lend some insights on this topic and attempt to answer some of these questions. Mark Manti has a PhD in Urban Studies from UW-Milwaukee and has been a full-time lecturer in their sociology department for 20 years. One of his core courses is criminology, with the main area of study being the political nature of victimless crime statutes and the social dynamics of the victimless crime enforcement situation. Thanks for being here. Ramon Valdez is an attorney at law in private practice centered on criminal defense with over 300 jury trials. He speaks at state and national conferences dealing with indigent defense, the Fourth Amendment, and the movement towards decriminalizing drug laws. He is a former state public defender in the Milwaukee Criminal Trial Division and has been in practice since 1997. Thanks for being here. Joe Zarneski has a master's degree in political science from UW-Milwaukee and has had a dis distinguished 30-year career in public service. He served three terms as Wisconsin State Senator where he chaired the Senate Education Committee as, and served as a member of the Joint Committee on Finance. He currently serves as the Milwaukee County Clerk. Thanks for being here. Bill Nook, uh, holding two degrees from the Milwaukee School of Engineering, started out teaching electronics at MATC, uh, but joined the economics department after earning his graduate degree in economics. He's been teaching at the Milwaukee Area Technical College for 18 years and is halfway toward earning another degree from uh, Northern Arizona University. Thank you all of you for being here. Uh, so Joe, uh, I can call you by your first name? Please do. Uh, <laughs> why is it necessary for society to criminalize so-called immoral behaviors between consenting adults? Well, as you said in your opening, liberty is the greatest freedom of an individual that is consistent with the freedom of other individuals in society. So in other words, you're free to do whatever you want as long as that doesn't interfere with my freedom to do what I want. So for example, you're not free to drive down the highway at 110 miles an hour because that interferes with my freedom to be safely on that highway at the same time you're on that highway. And that's why we have laws to protect the, f the individual freedoms of everyone in society, not just the um, individual freedom of one person. Would anyone else like to join in on that? Um, sure. Ray? Uh, you know, that, that's a very good point, that there are laws that are designed for a general good, uh, but there are other laws that infringe upon a person's individual liberties and an individual's, a person's individual right to 
make a decision on how they want to live their life. And if we can talk about uh, drug laws, we can talk about other moral type of laws like uh, prostitution. Uh, those are areas of the law where you hear the term <coughs> victimless crime thrown around and uh, there are studies on both sides that say, well, they aren't victimless crimes uh, in reality. And then there are people that do claim they're victimless crimes. So there's a, certainly an interplay between the types of laws you're talking about de designed for the, to promote the general good, like speeding laws, you can't drive 110 on the freeway, versus I'm sitting in my house alone uh, smoking a bowl of uh, marijuana. Uh, what harm am I causing there other than to maybe myself? Uh, so that, that's a different uh, interplay of the law. I would also talk about the very political nature of our victimless crime statutes, particularly when it comes to drugs. Uh, you know, the, <coughs> the lead into the show talked about liberty, and to me, there's a contradictory quality to the character of America in that, yes, we're about liberty and individual liberty, but the other side of that is what I and other social scientists call the prohibition impulse. Uh, at various times in our history, we've imposed laws, or the majority have imposed laws on minorities that uh, were very political in nature and were meant to uh, diminish the liberty of particular groups, particularly when you look at the early 20th century laws against drugs. They were directed primarily at groups that were thought to be the main users of drugs, uh, primarily uh, African Americans, uh, Mexican Americans. Uh, to, to, to prohibit something, what I call this prohibition impulse, just to say you don't want you don't want people to do it isn't going to make it so. I mean, you know, in another area that's analogous in some ways is the issue of teenage pregnancy. Uh, we have the highest teenage pregnancy rate in the world, um, and our response to it is to prohibit teenage sex and to tell teenagers that you know to abstain. Um, that's not working. Uh, other other advanced countries you know, deal with the reality that, uh, you know, young people are going to have sex or young people are going to have drugs, and they don't criminalize it. They don't criminalize addiction. We, we've criminalized addiction, and to me, that, that's the fundamental problem. Bill? I'd like to address the political nature of it, too. I mean, we're, we're a country that was, that was uh, originally settled by a bunch of Puritans, and uh, unfortunately, that heritage follows us to this day. You look at European countries, how they've dealt with these same problems. I, I've, I've spent extensive time in the Netherlands. Um, I did a teacher exchange there. Um, people look at uh, their laws and they think the, the people in the Netherlands, the residents are very liberal, but in fact, they're, you get to know them, they tend to be very conservative. But they also believe in, in individual liberty. And so they, they, they know they can't legislate prostitution away and they know they can't legislate uh, drug use away so they've uh, come to terms with it and uh, pretty much legalized it and, and regulate it and it works much better and then you look at the drinking problem uh, here in the United States uh, uh, pe uh, young people are forbidden to touch a drop of alcohol till they turn 21 and then magically all of a sudden it's not going to hurt them in Europe uh, children are brought up drinking at the dinner table as children and they're taught to drink responsibly and so they don't have the levels of alcoholism that we have here in the United States. So I think we need to rethink our approach. So uh, do you think that we're moving as a, as a society towards possibly the, the Dutch model of decriminalize, decriminalizing um, drugs and uh, legalizing prostitution? And if so, is I that haven't seen right evidence that we're moving in that direction, at least not in the last uh, eight or ten years. Um, and again, uh, Bill brought up the, the drinking age. Uh, I served in the state legislature when the drinking age was raised first from 18 to 19 and then from 19 to 21, which was something I personally opposed because my feeling is you either are an adult at 18 or you're not an adult at 18. And if you are an adult at 18, you should have all the rights and privileges uh, of an adult. And uh, we seem that clearly was a step backwards when it came to individual liberties of adults. Mm -hmm. I, I, right. when, I'm at, when I'm in court, I, I'm just amazed at the number of uh, simple possession cases. And, and for the most part, we can, let's just focus on, on marijuana, because there are arguments to be made about cocaine and, and it's more, you know, it's more dangerous components. But if we're talking about 
uh, say marijuana. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen uh, prosecutors going full bore on young people, you know, uh, young adults, uh, seeking convictions on these people. And it's the collateral consequences of these convictions that are just horrific. So we see this sort of mentality of, we're gonna save you from a life of drug addiction by ruining your life, by giving you a conviction. And that conviction, if you're in school, is gonna prohibit you from obtaining federal funding. It's gonna prohibit you from driving without high-risk insurance because they, they just changed it in the legislature. They, it's no longer mandatory, but a simple possession case, driving or not driving a car at the time, resulted in you losing your license. So what was, what's the justification or ramification there? We're, we're destroying a lot of young people's lives in the name of pursuing this, this uh, kind of very strange policy of we're gonna stop you from using drugs, from destroying yourselves, if that's the, the premise here. Well, Bill brought up the, the Netherlands and their addiction to serious drugs, like uh, heroin and cocaine, is treated as a uh, public health problem. You know, people get treatment, they don't, they're not incarcerated. You know, we, we have, again, this, this, this opposite approach, which is very politically popular because it, 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 it at least <clears throat> gives the illusion of politicians being tough on drugs, but in reality, uh, to the extent that I think there's gonna be reform of our drug laws and where we're gonna offer treatment as opposed to incarceration, it's gonna be because of the cost of it. Um, it, it's driving a lot of states bankrupt, incarcerating all these nonviolent drug offenders, and that's where the push is going to come from, to to start looking at treatment alternatives as opposed to incarceration. Uh, sure, we're seeing that now. We're, yeah. see, we're seeing that move now. There's diversion courts and uh, d deferred prosecution agreements <coughs> where a person uh, picks up a charge. Uh, they're not charged by the DA, but they're brought in for a charging conference. They're told with an attorney or without an attorney present jump through these hoops, and at the end of this period of time, six months, seven months, a year, uh, that case will go away. So we're seeing some of that now, and, and you're correct about the whole issue of, of the cost of incarceration. I mean, the, the jails are flooded with people who have, you know, again, simple possession cases. Your first one's a misdemeanor, uh, a certain level of drugs. Second one's a felony. So, and they're prosecuting those as felonies. Again, with loss of voting rights upon conviction, you know, uh, the, uh, jail time, $30,000 a year average to, to house somebody for a year. Massive societal costs that we bear as a whole, but also directed at that individual. The impact that has on that person's life is, is, is tremendous. So are economics driving, you know, changes in our criminal system? Well, I, I yes, certainly. I think the mm -hmm. forefront of that would be the state of California wrestling with multi-billion dollar budget deficits every year, they finally come to the conclusion that they simply cannot afford to incarcerate people for victimless crimes like, like cultivation and smoking marijuana. They simply can't afford it. I mean, already for something like two decades, they've been spending more money on their prison system than they have their higher educational system. And now I believe there's another three states that have joined them to the point that they have joined them as the group of states spending more money on incarceration than they do on higher education. Hmm. Effectively, marijuana is now legal in, it's, it's for medicinal purposes, it's legal in 14 states. For anybody, practically, it is essentially legal now in Colorado and California because any pain qualifies you for a prescription for marijuana. And then as long as you're willing to put your name in a public registry, you can buy 10 ounces a day in both those states. Another economic fact of life is that we've spent billions of dollars in the last decade on the so-called war on drugs and drug use and drug abuse has not declined as a result. Uh, in other words, we failed to learn from the lesson of alcohol prohibition, which what did alcohol prohibition do? As the economists will tell you, it created a black market for, for alcohol. And you had uh, and the, Al the Al Capone type gangsters controlling the illegal flow of alcohol in this country. And that's the same situation you have with marijuana and other drugs. We have created the drug cartels, which are the same as the Al Capone type gangsters uh, that we had during prohibition. And we've also, part of the victim crime enforcement situation is that uh, endemic is, is 
to that is police corruption. We, we, we expect our police officers to be saints, uh, you know, and to not be tempted by the huge amount of money involved in this. And, and most, of course, aren't, you know, they're tempted, but they don't, they don't succumb to it. But every, you know, every year you, you read about various police officers that, um, you know, took money, uh, were the first on the scene, uh, and you know, we expect them to be better people than, than a lot of us are in terms of not succumbing to the temptation of money or drugs. You have to become part of that world. You, know, you have to go undercover, whether it's prostitution or gambling, although gambling, now every, every gas station in the state's a gambling parlor. We've sort of resolved that issue largely for economic reasons. Uh, initially, it started a lot as a lottery to uh, relieve property tax burden, and of course, it, it mushroomed into now where literally every gas station is a, a gambling parlor um, for economic reasons. Uh, you know, in regard to drugs, again, you brought up the Netherlands example. You would think, oh well, now there's just going to be the ex explosion of, uh, of the drug problem and drug use in the Netherlands. The opposite is true. There's a lower level of of drug use in the Netherlands than there is in the United States. Sure. What I understand there is that mm -hmm. it's real easy to to go to these <coughs> areas, the zones where it's where it's more or less uh, condoned, and you can take your kids and show this is these are some of the reality of the impact of drug addiction, um, and you remove that sort of that glamorousness from the rebelliousness years of a young person's life, uh, and you take that away. You take that aspect away from it. So. Uh, you're able to take your, you know, young people and see the ramifications of heroin addiction, uh, uh, you know, and other harder, harder drugs. So, uh, to remove it from that, from the criminal area, to decriminalize it, to legalize it, uh, would remove all of that sort of uh, romanticism that gets that gets applied in that area with with young people, that rebelliousness. Uh, do you think that the um, our politicians? Um, reflect the will of, or the, the perception of the population on these issues, the, of the, the American population? Do you think that, you know, the people want one thing and the politicians are doing something differently? And that's why we're in the situation that we're in? I think to a point our politicians are in a straitjacket. Um, Anything they do to try to liberalize these laws, then they open themselves to charges of being soft on crime, and it, it you know, and so they're straightjacketed into uh, pushing for something that the majority of the population probably isn't in favor of, but enough of the population is is so hardline on the issue they feel they have no choice but to uh, go along. If I can add something, you know, right. there there are laws on our books right now that just are not enforced. Uh, and in fact, in, in preparing for this panel discussion today, I was uh, speaking with, uh, I guess, the producer uh, about uh, the adultery laws. Now, adultery is still a crime in the state of Wisconsin. It's a felony, and yet uh, it's just not enforced. So the, 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 the public will and uh, the, uh, the, the lawmakers' uh, desire to, to prosecute people who have committed adultery just doesn't happen anymore. Why? I would imagine it's because there's a serious economic impact if we uh, prosecuted people who are committing adultery. And uh, basic figures, what, 50% of all marriages end in divorce. We can probably assume most of those are because somebody was uh, uh, you know, committing adultery. Uh, a substantial portion of Wisconsin would be convicted felons right now. So at some level, the, the general population gets ahead of the law and and the lawmakers can be confronted with the reality of it is, well, we can prosecute everybody or just take a step back and leave it on the books, which is the safe thing to do, and not take a position that may cause some turmoil in the electorate. Picking up on what Bill was saying, you know, the whole the drug law, the phenomenon of drug laws in our society has is, is, is always been politicized. And it's, it's an easy issue, uh, you know, to manipulate people's fear and prejudice in regard to drugs when they have no, no real knowledge. Uh, we need to decriminalize addiction. If we were to re decri decriminalize addiction and offer treatment as opposed to incarceration, and of course not everybody's going to go clean, not everybody's going to give up their drug of choice, particularly if it's methamphetamine, cocaine, heroin, highly addictive drugs. 
Um, but you know, if they could get their drugs legally as addicts um, through clinics, which is done in much of Europe, we would undercut a lot of the crime associated with drugs. A, a, a guy named John, James Inciardi did a series of studies in Miami comparing non-narcotic drug users, mostly marijuana users, with narcotic drug users, pr pr principally heroin addicts, and he found that there was little or no crime associated, um, you know, other than the sale and use of it of itself uh, with non-narcotic with marijuana use, but there was just a, an enormous amount. Uh, he estimated that uh, for every time somebody gets caught uh, uh, as a thief uh, trying to support a heroin addict, they, they, they've committed another 300, 350 uh, crimes against property to support their habit. I mean, if we were to uh, decriminalize addiction, w we could eliminate an enormous amount of crimes against property and persons associated with that addiction. If, if, if drug addicts could get their drugs at clinics legally, um, again, we, we would eliminate, and, and, and I think the, the path to treatment is always open then. At the same time, we would eliminate a lot of the street crime associated with addiction. In, in order to understand the political problem, you have to understand who legislators are accountable to. They're not accountable to the public as a whole. They're accountable to the people who vote. And if I can go back to, to the drinking age issue, again, when, I was, when we were debating that in the legislature, I can count on one hand the number of calls and letters I got from people between 18 and 21 uh, who contacted me on that issue, but I got dozens and dozens and dozens of people over 21, over 35, over 65 saying raise the drinking age because those are the people who vote. And if you were a real cynic, you could say, well, we legalize drugs like tobacco and alcohol because they have lobbyists and spend a lot of money lobbying the legislators at the state, federal, and local level, but uh, the medical marijuana people uh, don't have that type of a lobby yet, and maybe that's why we haven't changed those laws. Mm. Yes, and when you legislate against victimless crimes, you, you, you cause an erosion of respect for the law. I mean, I, I went to Riverside High School, and uh, some of the people I went to high school with that smoked marijuana are now doctors, one living on Knob Hill in San Francisco, and the two of them are doctors in San Francisco. A number of them are lawyers, one's a judge, uh, a guy lived next door to a running back for the Green Bay Packers who uh, used to roll these big joints and then go for a bike ride. And uh, he, he managed to be a pro football player. Uh, we, we have uh, uh, past presidents who have admitted uh, marijuana use, even Rush Limbaugh himself admitted to you know, smoking marijuana a couple times, and yet somehow they went on and became very successful. And it, their, you know, flirting with a little bit of marijuana use in their early years didn't seem to negatively impact them in no in any way, shape, or form whatsoever. So when you say, well, to young people, you can't do that; it'll ruin your life. The, the smoking the marijuana won't ruin their life. It's just if they get caught doing it, the legal implications can ruin their life. So, do you think? Um it's, you mentioned the, the Puritans that we came over, with our, our, our pilgrims of Puritans, yeah. forefathers. Uh, do you think this is just a continuation of that kind of moral view of, of how society should be that doesn't really match up with how it really is? Well, it's partly that. Um, there's no, no, there's, you know, the one, one bucks on dangerous ground when you start uh, looking for a single factor. As a, as a trigger. I mean, it's a, it's a sum of a lot of things. That's just one of many things affecting Americans' viewpoint. We are in a, more, uh, in a, new, uh, in a new era of prohibition, though, Joe is right. You know, I mean, we, we didn't learn our lesson. I mean, prohibition was a complete failure. It, it, it basically handed a whole industry, the alcohol industry, to organized crime syndicates. Um, you know, the, the solution to the drug problem, in my view, is the same as the solution to to uh, the prohibition of alcohol, uh, you know, decriminalize use, uh, offer treatment, uh, you know, in the case of marijuana, in my view, we should legalize its use and possession. We should uh, control it, uh, tax it very heavily. Uh, we could use the taxes and revenues gained through the sale of legal marijuana uh, to help with uh, the treatment of addiction for harder drugs. The, the, the problem with our system is it's irrational. It preys on people's fear and prejudice. It, it's not logical. 
uh, in, in, the, in the sense that most people would think of a, of a rational, logical approach to a problem. It's, it's become totally politicized, and, and our, our, our solution is, is worse than, than the problem. Uh, and I, I don't know, maybe this, this, we also have a crime control industry that benefits greatly from uh, the criminalization of addiction, and, and that's a set of forces that want to keep it, you know, criminalized. And a good example of that in the extreme case is our neighbor to the south. I mean, just look at all the violence occurring in Mexico because of all the uh, tremendous amount of money to be made from supplying illicit drugs. So, you know, they've got the Al Capone syndrome now tenfold in Mexico and with the disastrous results. And that's why they're moving close to uh, legalizing marijuana and taking the, the huge profits away from the gangs, which then uh, erodes the gangs. That's how you have to attack it. Well, I'd like to thank the four of you for being here. That's our program today. Um, maybe someday uh, we can all learn to be tolerant of one another and in turn respect the rights and freedoms of everyone as human beings. Then we wouldn't need uh, anyone to save us at all. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.